Great, thanks very much, Fern. Um, I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the various lands on which we are meeting today. I too would like to thank you for joining us for the first of our legacy seminars. As Fern said, this is part of our celebrations of 50 years of outstanding contributions from ARI staff and to reflect on the benefit for the community and to look forward to our next phase. Here's the stellar lineup of speakers that we have organized to speak as part of this legacy seminar series. Some fantastic topics and they'll proceed over the next few months. I'm really looking forward to the wealth of knowledge and experiences that these folks are going to share with us. As Fern said, we'd love you to join us for all of them. We will send out notices and invitations for these seminars and please tell your colleagues all about them. I think it's a, a great thing to do and a great thing to celebrate. So my connections to ARI go back to 1977. Yes, I'm as old as you thought I was. So back in 77, I first worked for the Fisheries and Wildlife Division. And my connections since then have been quite varied in different capacities over the period. So this included conducting field surveys to provide inventory for various species. As a Commonwealth official in 1984, attending my first orange-bellied parrot recovery team meeting, and watching the formidable skills and knowledge of Peter Menkhorst at work. I also have taken up a role back at the Institute in 1990, when the Institute had integrated policy planning and research staff who worked side by side. After that, I moved into East Melbourne in the mid nineties and the research groups remained at Heidelberg. I've also been an investing collaborator in research over that period. And I was fortunate enough to come back to the Institute in 2012 as the research director. So it's through these various lenses that I offer the perspectives and reflections in today's talk. But I'll come back to this at the end. So today my talk's going to cover the formal opening and the operating environment at the time describe some of the changes in roles and personnel, talk about the current roles, how throughout this whole 50 years, having impact is absolutely central to the work we do. I'd like to celebrate many significant achievements. I'd like to celebrate many people. And I'm looking forward to the continued benefit of the Institute for the community. So here's a photo of how the Institute looks today. It's formerly known as the Arthur Ryler Research, Arthur Ryler Institute for Environmental Research. And of course, ARI, as we colloquially know it, is the Biodiversity Research Centre for DELP. ARI is a branch within the Biodiversity Division, and we're within the Environment and Climate Change Group of the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning. But from ARI's perspective, it all started at the official opening on the 8th of April, 1970. And the opening was by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, and she was accompanied by Princes Philip and Charles, and also Princess Anne. And those days, the uh, purpose of the Institute was described as an Institute for Environmental Research, because an understanding of the environment, of what contributes to it, what changes it, and of what is found in it, is essential to management and conservation of the resource. In my view, that citation is just as relevant today as it was then. In those days, there were 30 staff. There were purpose-built facilities at Heidelberg. A really big event, and I live locally, and my neighbours still talk about the Queen driving down their street, our street, in her Rolls Royce. So you're probably wondering why was it called after Arthur Ryler? Here's a citation that the Queen read out at the event. The development of the Serendip Wildlife Station, which was at Lara. The development of the State Wildlife Reserve. Increasing public awareness of pesticides and pollution. And the establishment of this research facility itself all owe their existence in some measure to the efforts of Sir Arthur. So who was Sir Arthur? He was the Deputy Premier. 
In those days, there was also a role of chief secretary. He was also a government leader in the Legislative Assembly. And along the way, he was also attorney general. And you can see there that he was responsible for quite progressive changes in Victorian society. Believe it or not, opening picture theatres on Sundays, allowing sport on Sunday, was a very progressive activity that Arthur oversaw. He also uh, reformed the outmoded liquor laws and introduced these two really essential safety features about making seatbelts compulsory, but also random breath testing. So he was quite a figure, quite an impressive figure. And in my mind, a great honour for the Institute to be named after Sir Arthur. So what was happening way back then when the Institute was established? This book, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, was published in 1962. It drew attention to the ecological message that humans were endangering their natural environment. And this book is attributed by groups such as the New York Times as having a major influence on the environmental movement globally in, in a way that no one else had ever had before. It was a time of burgeoning understanding and concern for the environment. In 1970, the first Earth Day was held. The US EPA was established. In 1971, the Victorian EPA was established. And there was a national refocusing of research groups such as CSIRO Wildlife Research and CSIRO Fisheries. So quite a formidable time of rethinking in society about the importance of the environment. What else was happening in 1970? Well, duck hunting was really popular. My recollection is that there was something like more than 100,000 licensed duck shooters in those days. And here's a great photo of a bloke that some of you will know. That's the Premier of Victoria, Henry Bolte, at the time, who was an active shooter. Elsewhere in the world, the Isle of Wight Music Festival had 600,000 people turn up. And Jimmy was one of the leads at that event. 100,000 people demonstrated in Washington against the Vietnam War. It was the year that the Apollo 13 mission to the moon had its accident. I was in year nine at Pran High School and our own Tim O'Brien fondly remembers being one of the excitable children at the ARI opening. And of course, fashion had reached its absolute pinnacle of sartorial elegance in those days. I think I might've actually had a shirt like that myself, but I didn't, wasn't lucky enough to have the vest. We had no mobile phones, we had no email, but we did have a typing pool. And if you typed the letter, you'd give it, you, if you wanted a letter typed, you'd give it to the people in the typing pool, it would be sent off through snail mail, and maybe in a few weeks you'd get an answer. Nothing like the turnaround we get today. Even basic things like global positioning systems weren't readily available in those days. And yet we had lots of people out in the field finding it really difficult to accurately determine where they were. So what did ARI do in those days? Heavily focused on pesticides. We used gas chromatography techniques, and that's the photo in the bottom, that's one of the labs. One of the best known applications of the analysis was the DDT in peregrine falcons. And of course we managed, we looked after, we provided science for the control of kangaroos, perennial issue, we also worked in offshore fisheries, recreational fishing, fishes, and we compiled the very first estimates of the harvest of game birds, ducks, quail, and snipe. Now, over the years, there's been various comings and goings from the Institute, lots of changes over this period, changes in the groups, the administrative groups, the functions, and people coming and going. And here's some key examples. Queen opens the Institute in 1970. The 70s was known for our work on pesticides, analysis and field-based work. In the 80s, we recombined the research program and policy functions at the Institute. 
1990, the Flora and Fauna branch was first formed, a few years after the Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act had been brought in. And that branch included the freshwater ecology section, reflecting an increased focus on science to understand the conservation of native freshwater fish. In the 90s, we were increasingly emphasising the quality of our science. In the early 90s, the Flora Research Group moved from Kew to join the team at Heidelberg. In 1995, Premier Jeff Kennett was elected and his philosophies were that research was activity that should be done in the private sector. So the four research institutes that were in operation in government in our portfolio at the time were privatised. Attempts were made to make that a going concern, but in the end, the privatisation failed. Now, I mention this because this was a time of great movement and great disruption for many staff. In 2000, we had our first full-time research director. 2008, we had our first science leader. We also had a collaboration leader appointed. And in the noughties, probably the emphasis coming out of that failed privatisation was an institute had an increased emphasis on business acumen. In the early part of this millennium, we produced the ARI research strategy and we did an independent science review. And there's been many fantastic innovations, developments and achievements that has come as part of this comings and goings. So here's a sample of just a few of them. In the 70s, probably into the 80s, there were field surveys that Institute staff did for Land Conservation Council studies, it was absolutely foundational work for Victoria. It's the foundation that's been culminated in our extremely sophisticated understanding about distributions of species and habitats. But equally importantly, these studies led to an increase in reservation of land within the park system. The Atlas of Victorian Wildlife was established at ARI in the early 80s. The Longfoot of Potteroo was discovered and described in this decade. The ban on DDT came straight out of the work that we had done at the Institute, particularly on the Peregrine. In the 90s, late 80s into the 90s, Andrew Corrick read, led a wetland mapping project that had the formidable task of describing, mapping, and uh, covering the vegetation types in every wetland in the state that was greater than one hectare, a formidable achievement, which I don't think has ever been rivaled anywhere else in Australia. In 1992, the Institute's field surveys of flora and fauna were inst instrumental in the comprehensive regional forest assessments, which led to the regional forest agreements. A lead shot ban in hunting was introduced in 1996, a result of the work that Ian Norman and others did at the Institute about lead toxicity in ducks, particularly black ducks. In the noughties, this was the big decade of innovation, particularly around fish ecology and fish biology. There's quite a few samples there. We also had our very early native veg vegetation categorization and of course, we were instrumental in developing techniques to understand the ecology of bats using harp traps and automated acoustic bat detectors and analyzers. 2009, the horrific Black Saturday fires affected us as it did the community broadly. Our work was instrumental about rescuing fish and understanding how to house them and then release them back into the wild so they survived the post fire issues that happen in the landscape. It was also a great focus for nature-led community recovery. Recovery which was good for people, but also good for biodiversity. In the early decades of this millennium, the native fish strategy was a really prominent contribution that many at the Institute contributed to. Then we really got into habitat distribution models at quite an industrial scale. Galaxids were described, 13 new species were described in 2014. Working with our colleagues in head office, 
the development of the strategic management prospects was another key milestone. We also were innovative in introducing electrofishing boats for saline waters, and we've used those extensively in estuaries. And of course, the phase out of timber harvesting that was announced last year, we claim a bit of the contribution to that through the formidable work that the forest ecology team have done, particularly on gliders and possums. So what are we like nowadays? We've got about 100 staff. We have admin safety team. We study plants, animals, and ecological communities across terrestrial, aquatic, and estuarine environments. We're all about ecology, and we have people that are specialists in molecular ecology, mathematical ecology, spatial and analytical ecology, and we have on in-house uh, in biometricians. We've got purpose-built facilities, including a fabulous new storage shed on site. We've got field vehicles and boat fleet that are ours. And I'm proud to say we've still got the last remaining departmental library across the Victorian Public Service. So here's the leadership team, the current leadership team. These folks are fantastic megastars. And I really do want to extend my sincere appreciation to this current leadership team. In my mind, they're the glue that really helps stick together the many moving parts of the complex ARI machine. And this is demonstrated through collaboration, coordination, strategic operational thinking, dedication, resilience, and deep interest in the culture of our institute and our group of people. Our business model, really coming out of that 1996 attempt at privatisation, means that we're essentially a fee-for-service research institute within DELP. And this pie chart gives you a feel for the different sectors of DELP and the portfolio that invest in research projects with us. And this is a sample from a couple of years ago, but it's just as relevant this year. I think it's fair to say, based on this contributions from disparate parts of the department and portfolio, that ARI really is the DELP Research Institute. Part of our success, part of our contributions are having really great relationships and collaborating with lots of partners. And here's a few of them. I couldn't actually fit them all onto the chart, but it gives you a feel of the diversity from different parts of the portfolio, such as Parks Victoria, the CMAs, but also uh, academic institutions and community groups, particularly through Landcare, for example. Nowadays, our capability is quite different to what it was years ago. And here's a few snapshots about some of the capability. Decision analysis has become a really core capability within the Institute. And this has particularly been led by Tracy Reagan and Josephine McHunter. And it's played out through the strategic management prospects work, but also the fire modeling that we've been doing. The photo up on the top right is that handsome young chap, James Shelley, who's been pioneering our use of ENA e-DNA sampling in the, field, in the field. So would you believe that we can actually collect DNA in the field, the backpack does some of the um, sorting of that material and then we take it, send it off to the laboratory. It seems that we were, aren't that far away from actually being able to do species identifications in the field with a similar sort of back to, backpack to the one that you're seeing there. We're also uh, working into the space of ways of knowing country and a really important collaboration with our traditional owners. We've pioneered techniques about citizen science. So not only figuring out how to do it, but also how to do it to the most advantage for our portfolio. And then more recently, we've developing capabilities around behavior, behavior change science. We're working closely, for example, with the zoos who've got a campaign with the RSPCA about safe cats. And Fern Hames is now leading that uh, activity for us at the Institute. And it's my pleasure today to um, welcome Dr. Lily Van Eden from University of Sydney, who's literally started with us today as our new postdoctoral fellow in behaviour change. So welcome, Lily. So key thing for us is about having impact. 
How do we make sure we are having impact? We are an applied research institute. Having impact is absolutely essential as to our success. So five years ago, we took the simple step of just asking our clients about our performance. And we've now got a very sophisticated process of seeking uh, feedback from our key clients about our work. We ask them standard sets of questions and these are the sorts of results that we get. There are stunning, stunning samples there. 100% of clients rate our services as good or better. So these provide us with really direct feedback at a project level about our performance. We use them to unpack what's gone well and we also use it to understand what opportunities for improvement we can identify with the client. And this has really been fundamental to continuous improvement. And we've been able to track these improvements to make sure that they're having the effect. So that's great, but we wanted to go a bit deeper than that. And Andrew Bennett, who has worked with us for the previous five years as our science leader, led a project about understanding and evaluating the research impact for the Institute. He's produced a paper for us, which we were on the verge of releasing just before we went into lockdown. And we'll get back to that when we can. But the big conclusion from Andrew's work is that we think there are four enablers that facilitate the pathway to impact. Engagements, relationships, credibility, reputation, relevant and applicable knowledge, communication, dissemination. So we've, this has come out of a global review of the literature and interviews with key stakeholders. It's produced this conceptual, this sophisticated conceptual model that you can probably just get a feel for at the bottom right of the corner. So we've then converted that into, if these are the four enablers, what are the key performance criteria that will allow us to estimate our performance against each of those? And that's the detail there under each of those four headings. Stepping through those one at a time, so engagement and relationships with clients based on data from our client surveys. And here's the summary for one of our parameters, the relevance of recommendations made by our work to the investors over the five year period. The next type of evidence base is about credibility and reputation. And we're using data from refereed publications. And this is a chart of the number of refereed papers produced by staff at the Institute. And fortunately, fantastically, there's been a steady increase in that trajectory. Another evidence base we're using around communication dissemination is to look at the amount of contacts that we have with our partners, our stakeholders, our community of interest. And here's some of the parameters that Fern and her team have been measuring over the last little while. The numbers are incredibly impressive. We're reaching 1,400 people through our e-news. We are reaching 1,000 or more people about our seminar announcements, for example. Coming out of all of that work, the conclusions are that sure, there's more that we can do to further improve, making sure we have the best impact we can. And here's five actions that we are going to propose and pursue. And once we come out of lockdown, we'll actually get together, host some workshops with key st stakeholders and work through, the, work through those options. So that's data. I mean, you'd, you'd really want me to be talking about data seeing we're a research institute. No question, data is our core business. But equally, the success of the institute is really all about the people. Our estimate is that possibly around a thousand people have worked at the Institute and contributed to ARI's success. Now, all of these individuals deserve recognition and gratitude, but that's impossible to do. It's impossible for me to really do justice to it as a seminar. So I want to particularly focus on a special acknowledgement of our current legends. These are people that are still working with us at the Institute and they have made formidable contributions. 
So I'd like to start with John Hewan, who joined us way back in 1982. John is an internationally renowned fish biologist. He's published a massive number of scientific publications in very high impact journals. He's been the recipient of awards, various awards. He's also made massive contributions through the Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act Scientific Advisory Committee. You can see he's had a couple of quite long stints in there, made an absolute mark in that regard. He's chaired many recovery teams and for his work, he's been recognised by the Professional Society for Fish Biologists as a lifetime member. More recently, John's roles have involved very highly strategic research direction, science quality and mentoring, and developing science staff at all levels across the Institute. Thanks, John. It's been a massive contribution. Next one is Lindy. Lindy joined a couple of years after. No, same time. Let me just check. Same time, 1982. She commenced her professional career at the museum. She's worked extensively on large-scale fauna research, as well as Leadbeater's Possum Advisory Group. And of course, an amazing contribution, probably internationally, certainly nationally, about bat ecology over 40 years. She's had a formidable impact on students, the many, many students she's worked with as a mentor and supervisor. And this work was recognised in 2019 with the awarding of a Victorian Public Service Medal for Lindy. And to top it off, not only is she an honorary life member of the Australian Australasian Bat Society, she's also had a bat named after. Now this is a rare honour. And look at this gorgeous animal. Who wouldn't love having that named after them? So fabulous recognition, fabulous contribution. I'd also like to acknowledge another one of our current senior legends, Tim O'Brien, who joined at the same time. Tim's had multiple roles across Arthur Ryler Institute. He's been the science manager of the Aquatic Ecology Group, and he's also been, is the current science manager of the Community Ecology section. He's got formidable expertise and experience around freshwater fish, migration, movement and water quality requirements. Currently he's supervising 20 scientific staff in very diverse areas including vegetation, fire, spatial analysis, water birds, threatened species. For a long time, continuing up to today, he has managed the Sustainable Rivets Audit which has been an amazing contribution to understanding about fish. And of course, he's actually published papers on fishways. So this major review published in 2010 about fishways with colleagues at the Institute. Again, another formidable contribution. And last, but by no means least, is our, our other legend, Peter Menkhorst. Peter's led incredible number of really high profile national recovery programs. I alluded to the orange belly parrot work, which has been going for just short of 40 years. But of course, the helmeted honey eater is another significant contribution that Peter has made. He's worked on koalas and been instrumental at the national level. Peter has published 119 papers and three books. And of course, this includes two field guides, one about mammals, one about birds. There aren't too many people in the world that are able to pull off a feat like that. And of course, Pete has had wide recognition for this significant contribution through the science work and also through publishing the books. He's a member of various committees. He's been awarded the Australian National History Medallion, the Whitley Medal, and in 2019 was honoured also with a Public Service Medal. So, Back to my contributions and really to provide some further personal reflections from my perspective. ARI is a great place to work, especially because of the people. I'm constantly impressed by the knowledge, experience and generosity of these people. 
and it's an incredibly stimulating group to work with. At ARI, I get a really strong sense of being part of a group that's making a huge difference. And we're doing this through providing evidence to benefit nature and to the community. So I feel incredibly privileged to be the director of the Institute, to have the opportunity to work with and hopefully support this formidable group of people. And to me, ARI provides all of this material in absolute spades. So in summary, I hope that this talk has provided deeper insights into why ARI matters and about how the dedicated people who have worked here and are still working here have made this happen. In my view, the future of ARI looks very bright. And including the emergence of future generations of ARI legends, many of whom are in the making right now. So looking forward, here's a few ideas about things that we will undertake over the next little while, things that we will further investigate, because ARI success has always been about people at the Institute looking forward. There are quite a few new capabilities in there. We also are doing, going to undertake deeper dives into leadership development, diversity and inclusion, work on this impact pathway even harder. And of course, it's really important to all of us to support self-determination. Thank you for listening today and for joining us as we keep the celebration of the 50 anniversaries of success of ARI going. Watch out for the rest of the talks in the series. I'd particularly like to thank Andy Geschke and Fern Hames for helping me improve this talk. And if you'd like to hear more about our work, we've got a fabulous website. Here's the details where you can dial that up. Thanks again for listening. Very glad you could join us today. Look forward to seeing you at the next seminars. Thank you. Bravo, Kim. Thank you. <laughs> It feels really weird. Um, it does sound weird, doesn't it? In, in a room by myself. <laughs> but um, thank you very much. That was a fab fabulous talk. And um, it's really wonderful to see ARI's work brought together like that and help us reflect on so many things over the years and the things that we have to look forward to. Um, certainly science that does have impact and science that matters. Yes, thanks, Brad. <laughs> so... Um, Questions. I, I I was watching the slides and wasn't really looking for questions that much, but I know Andy was keeping track of whether there are any questions and whether there might have been any um, still perhaps over on the webinar site. Andy, have you picked up any questions uh, through the chat? And people, please still use the chat now to ask questions of Kim. I'm going to pause for a minute and see what we have and ask Andy. So I haven't seen any questions come through, but anyone feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think use the chat right now if you do have a question, or you can use the raise your hand function. We do have about 240 people online, and I'm not sure if it's filtering based on raised hands. So if you do have a rare hand raised, I might know someone has one, but I might not know who's doing it. So um, we'll see how we go, but please add some questions in the chat and we'll try to get to them. Okay, so there is a question here, Kim. I'd be interested in why ARI has survived where other institutes have not. Absolutely. Uh, so I think it goes back to that slide that I had a couple of minutes ago. Um, so part of it is, you know, the absolute dedication of the staff, but of course there are dedicated staff everywhere. I think also, to be really frank, the attempt at privatisation in the mid 90s was a terrible period for all of us, but we actually did get some benefit out of it. We got this business acumen that has led us into the situation where probably the survival of the Institute has really been around doing our business really well, communicating it really well, working with our partners effectively. If things haven't gone well, we've got an attitude of understanding that not being defensive and trying to approve on it. And I'd have to say, 
you know, we clearly have impressed successive leaders within the department, you know, very senior executive leaders that have benefited and valued having the Institute around. And not the least of which has been the recent announcement about the cessation of hardwood logging in Victoria, the work that Lindy, Jenny, Louise, Gemma in the latest iteration have done to help the government really understand the impact that forestry has been having, but also to give them options about how they might be able to achieve conservation in a way that's acceptable to the government. I reckon that unique space, that niche that we operate within government has really been a part of the success and the longevity of the Institute. Indeed. There's a couple more questions there, Kim. One is, is ARI being impacted much by the COVID situation? And slightly separate question, um, working and the future funding outlook? The funding model at ARI seems at times very precarious. Always precarious. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, have we been impacted? Well, many of us have... Um, been at home for 10 weeks now. And we're all experiencing the challenges that come from that. Another part of it is the research, the field work. We had to cease for a while. We had to work through with the department about how we could make sure that our staff were safe in being able to get into the field and do the important work which we all want them to do. And so it took a little while, but we've worked through that and we're pretty much mostly back to a normal field activity, which has been great. And of course, we, we all know that, you know, this weird arrangement, so I'm standing in my living room giving a talk to a couple of hundred people. It's really weird, <laughs> there's no doubt about that. But every, every day working at home is pretty weird as well and trying to manage that balance between, you know, supporting your family, being with your family, but also contributing in the way that's so important to all of us, that's been challenging. Um, I think we've learned a few things out of the exercise. So um, I, for one, will be much more supportive of flexible work arrangements, because I can see the benefit of it, and I've had the benefit of it myself. We've got, we're a little bit behind schedule on a few things, so it's going to be a bit of a challenge to make sure that we don't overwhelm staff in trying to catch up. Precare, well, the prospects we think are okay. So senior leadership team has discussed this regularly over the last couple of months. Uh, we think prospects are going to be fine for the next financial year. Um, We've got lots of work that's already on the books for next year. So at the moment, we think it's we, we think we're travelling okay. We we think it'll be hopefully pretty much business as usual. So Fern, were they the two questions? No, there's a couple more. Right. <laughs> so the next one's from Kate, where she asks. Well, she says, "So glad you still have your physical library, as we all are. How did you manage that?" and dodge the skip of book death. <laughs> yes, I've been to the skip of book death, Kate. <clears throat> Sounds like you have too. It's a skip out at a big um, storage facility out Werribee, part of the old ag um, facility at Werribee, where the holdings from all of the departmental libraries are taken and where they're uh, holding you know, particular books or journals or whatever are considered not to be worthy there, put in a skip. I think sometimes they're sent overseas to third world countries, but sometimes they're trashed. When I became aware of that, um, I had some very serious conversations with the government librarians about how a research institute, one of its absolute essential tools of trade are access to uh, written material. Not so much journals these days because so many of the journals are available on electronic subscription. But the holdings of the monographs that we have at the Institute, including um, theses, a high degree postgraduate theses that we've collected over the journey, 
a, a, a unique resource. And it wouldn't really make sense to run the gauntlet of a skip or have them in a central library, which, you know, there is only one central library in town that's the whole of government. So direct intervention, I think, is the polite way to say it, Kate. And I can share some of the anecdotes with you privately because probably not fit for airing on, on the airwaves. It's another form of impact and influence, Kim, hey? Trying to, <laughs> trying to. And I thought I might actually have to lock the front door one day when some people turned up, but that's another story. <laughs> I remember that day. Um, here's a question from Karen. This is a pretty easy one. How are the fish rescued from the recent fires going? I think they're going fabulously. Um, I haven't actually physically been in to see them, but I know that dedicated people like Mike Nickel and John Marnie and a couple of other people whose names are escaping me at the moment are in there every day. Would you believe we, um, we've actually invaded their privacy and we've set up webcams in the uh, aquarium so that it spares those folks from coming in at the weekends to check them. And all of the reports I've had are that they're doing well, as are the crayfish and as are the mussel, mussels. Even though they're called depressed mussels, I don't think they're that depressed at the moment. So. Okay. Um, there's another one here. Does ARI have much interaction with the equivalent organisations in other states in Australia? And how does that work? Well, I think as the earlier question alluded, there aren't many of like-minded organisations left. Um, there were really big research institutes in Western Australia and New South Wales. I think progressively they've been absorbed back into departments. So, um, so there hasn't actually been the opportunity to um, interact with those people, but but maybe I'm missing something. Maybe there are connections. I'll be happy to follow it up. There's one about, um, tell us more about the current ARI office pets. <laughs> now, what would that be? Would that be the turtles? Or would that be? Maybe the frogs and the legless lizard? Or... Ah, there you go. Sorry, That's... Andy. Had a suggestion? The catfish also, possibly, caddy. Again, I haven't been there for 10 weeks. So, <laughs> Fern, you walked past them this morning. How'd they look? They're great. I'm looking out <laughs> my window now just to see if the turtles are there. Hang on a sec. So the receptionists and the other admin team folks that have been coming in occasionally have been looking after the pets. Michelle and Maria and the reception are the people that do most of that work and they've been coming in sporadically. So they're probably feeling very lonely and we're all looking forward to catching up. Um, are there research collaborations between ARI and AgVic? Uh, not so much these days. It's quite interesting. So part of the staff at KTRI included um, Michael Johnson and Alan Robley. And I actually joined ARI and other parts of KTRI did go to AgVic. Um, John Weiss, um, and I think I saw someone else's name um, on the list. We, we had some interactions, a couple of, there we go, the uh, invasive plant mob, that's Jackie Steele. And I think that's where Jackie works these days still, hopefully. Um, those interactions, uh, sporadic, uh, infrequent, but really keen to talk about whether we should be resurrecting those. So, Jackie, give me a call. I'll be happy to talk through more of that. And, of course, there's project-level connections. So, you know, the, the botanists in particular, you know, you know what it's like. It's hard to keep botanists from talking to each other, and they just regularly talk to each other and work through these things. So my understanding is a lot of that's still going on. So there's a question here about capability, Kim, and, and you you did touch on this already, but you might want to expand on it. Thank you for the talk. How have you seen the research, analytical, other skill set at ARI change over the years? And where do you see the demand for new skills going in the next 10 years? 
Absolutely. So the, the slide that I posted up, which talked about the new capability we've got, eDNA, uh, citizen science, behaviour change science, ways of knowing country, things like structured decision making, they're definitely on the vanguard of the next phase of work and big impact that the Institute is going to have. The DNA work, I also alluded to that it won't be that far away, hopefully, before we're able to actually do species identifications using DNA in the field. Now, I find that absolutely staggering because when I started my PhD back in the late 70s, I tried to get some genetic work done and it just was impossible. Um, nowadays, the sort of things that I was trying to do, people like James Shelley are actually doing in the field and they'll actually be able to do more of that work. The, the, the other things that I highlight in my slide, I haven't got it in front of me right at the moment, but about um, boundary spanning. And, you know, this is a, a kitsch word about um, having influence, having impact, stepping uh, between where we operate and where people that we want to have impact work. The boundary spanning between that is uh, a skill that, we need to cultivate more. We've got really great expertise in that space, but there are more ways that we can elaborate that and share that more widely with more staff at the Institute. And equally, um, the work around impact. So particularly the work that I alluded to that Andrew Bennett led for us. Having that impact, there, there, there's this whole new science emerging about impact. And, you know, if you've had anything to do with a university for the last decade, universities have been asked to articulate more effectively the impact of the investment that the Commonwealth Government's giving to them. And there's a science emerging around that. And frankly, the work that Andrew's done, um, I'm hoping that Andrew will publish in a peer reviewed journal because uh, in my view, it's cutting edge science about understanding about having impact. So there's a, there's a couple of examples. Um, there's one here from Caroline Kim. It says, how can your average person help or contribute to what you do? I reckon that's a question you should answer. Fern, what do you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Carolyn, Fern leads our communication and collaboration group. And one of the many things that she's been doing is really diving deep into this question about, you know, how can we work with members of the community to not only make it interesting for the community, but also get meaningful science out of the work that they're doing. And that's the banner, that's the lens that we look at citizen science on. So supporting people to, you know, provide rigorous information from the right places is part of the challenge in that space. And, you know, we're absolutely lucky, and I alluded to this earlier in the talk, that the advent of mobile phones and the digital technology that comes with that is just seen an, a massive transformational change in the ability of people making observations to be able to communicate it. The work for us to do is to find ways to better support the community to collect those data in ways that are scientifically rigorous and also to supplement their efforts with the particular capabilities that you can't um, uh, expect the average member of the public to have, such as about, you know, design of data collection analysis, statistical analysis, and um, then probably working in collaboration to have that published. So there's quite a few um, ways that we can do it. And I think there's a hot link in your question from Andy that talks about some of the resources that we've got available. And I'm sure Fern and Andy and others would love to talk more with you about that if you'd like. Yeah, thanks Andy for posting the link. Nice but, work Andy. Yeah, there's another question here. Uh, great presentation, Kim. Thanks for sharing. Are you proposing to have a 50 year reunion with <laughs> ARI legends and staff? Absolutely. Who, who asked that question? Where is that? Well, <laughs> A organ. So I don't know who that Aaron is. Aaron organs. Yeah, Aaron organs. From... Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. Absolutely. Yes. Um, how are you, mate? 
Yeah, pretty good. Great presentation. Thank you. Yeah, we're we're um, we've been stymied by the lockdown, and um, the message we're getting is that we'll still be in lockdown for a little bit longer, but um, hopefully with you know crowds turning up the footy and so forth, um, there'll be an allowance to get a gathering together. Hopefully before the end of the year, and we're really looking forward to you know sharing that with legends that no longer work at the Institute and celebrating their contribution and the combined success. So watch out for it. Um, I can put in a plug. Um, John Kewen is working up a little memento book that really focuses about people and the contributions that people have made. And equally, Fern and Lindy are working up an updated, more corporate brochure about the impact that generations of contributors have made to Victoria through ARI. So watch out for those that are coming. Uh, if you want to let us know if you're interested in coming, send me an email and we'll start compiling a list to add to the already long invite list that we've got. And that's open to everyone. Well, I think I've been through all the questions I could see. Uh, if somebody still has a question that we haven't answered, pipe up or retype it or use your hand up um, little button there and we'll see if we can answer your question or have we dealt with them all. I think the one about um, having a bit of a reunion is potentially a really good one to end on, Kim. It's a nice Absolutely. celebratory um, yee-haw kind of moment, hey? Yee-haw. <laughs> and so thanks for all the questions. Really uh, glad that I managed to pull myself up so that we had time to talk. So thank you very much for your interest. Thank you, Kim. Thanks for answering all those questions. Thanks to the, I think, 214 people that we had online today was really terrific. Please keep your eyes open for the next one in the series. There is a whole series of them running towards the end of the year. And again, as I mentioned right at the start, we'll be recording them, we'll be sharing them, we'll be collecting key points from them as well. And keep in touch. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Andy, for the tech. Thanks so much, Kim. Thanks, everybody. Great to see you all online. Have a good day, everybody. Bye.